Thank you, Your Excellency, opening this session. And I would like to express my gratitude to the ICD for taking care of such, a, such an event, which allows us to share our views on the ideas, what is going on in the world nowadays, and just to be able to prepare some ideas there. Uh, you, you, you see what is happening now. We have a, we have a, uh, uh, to my mind, we have a change to the, to the worst, to the negatives. You know, uh, there is a well. Thirty years ago, there was a process of globalization, which means that, in fact, we were trying to create open societies to everything. We had the global goods, commodities. We had the global values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But no, now it's, it, it, I have a feeling that is breaking up. You know, for example, what is happening in Russia, what is happening in the United States with tariffs, well, the the reactions, the anti-reactions. That's that's that, that, that's a worry. You know, that's a worry. And uh, we think we, what's going to happen. Of course, there are different ways to explain. One could say that because we have now very fast technological progress. And during these times, democracy is getting lower. The other one could say that, you know, for nowadays, it's not a time for democracy because we have big environmental problems in the world. But today, I'm going to, to specify what is connected with income distribution within a society and between societies. That's an important issue, believe me. Well, I, I, I'm, I was not engaged on such a type of research, but three, four years ago, I started to realize that it's, 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 it's affecting the societies. Sometimes, sometimes people, countries, were creating regimes, overcome this problem. And after that, we had had even world wars, you know. And the, behind that, we see that inequality, which differs, which is getting up, and is getting down. And during this transformation, we are having, we are having uh, big processes in the world. Uh, and let me, let me mention this to start with this idea. So the before industrial revolution, the inequality, the inequality between nations was low, but inequality within nations, uh, within nations was high. So, you can, maybe you could not believe, but uh, in the, at the end of 18th century, before Industrial Revolution, China was number one by GDP per capita. And living standard in England was not better than in Africa. You know, when you take the consumption, even that was better there. Of course, due to the Industrial Revolution, due to the technical means, um, very soon we see Europeans in Africa occupating, etc., etc. You know, but today I started very with a, with with a very interesting joke, with a very interesting joke, which which uh, well, it's amazing joke, it's amazing joke, uh, which shows which shows that mm, uh, that the income distribution could uh, could st strongly hurt the ideology. For example, the joke is like this. Uh, this is uh, uh, an accident uh, 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 at the passport control at the airport in the United States. So, uh, civil servant asks, nationality? The answer is Russian. The second question, occupation? The answer is no, no, just visiting. You know? Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the, the mean of that? You know, and these tensions are increasing. Are increasing. The other issue, uh, the other issue of that, the, the other issue, yes. Uh, after the Industrial Revolution, the inequality between nations has increased. Between nations. But inequality within nations has decreased. You know? And uh, this is the reason behind of current high streams of migrants. You create a global world. You have very good life in one part of the world. You have very bad life on the other part of the world. I'm not going to sit the, and to wait for the investment in the other part. 
I'm going to come to you. Be because you have a better life. And that's created tension, political tension. And this is logical. If you are saying that this is a global world, it should be global by the parameters for the everybody. At least people should realize that the inequality is decreasing. But you will see now how it is increasing between nations. Between nations. And that's, that's, that's the problem. Uh, as a result of two world wars during the 20th century, inequality has sharply declined. You know? Very interesting. But the dynamics of the world economy during the, uh, the peace time is accompanied with increasing of inequality. According to the Paul Krugman, I love him very much, in 2005, uh, his former, uh, uh, former advisor to the president of the United States, Nobel Prize laureate, you know, uh, Paul Krugman, well, very famous. Uh, in other words, he's very famous among economists, yeah. Um, yeah. In 2005, 20% of the richest Americans owned 44.3% of the total income. This is exactly the same figure we had had at the end of uh, 1920s. So, and uh, here is the problem. Uh, another crisis is coming. Because, because an interesting thing here is that whatever we see, uh, well, one could not say that the war especially world war is a good thing. But during this war, inequality was decreasing, you know. And when we have a peace, inequality is increasing and creates another ground for the other war. You know, that's the fact. That's the fact, you know. Or income inequality in the modern world. In 2005, 1% of rich Americans owned 17.4% of total income. It's too high, 17.4. But what is going on in the world on average with the same figure? You have 50%. This is the estimation of the, of the global rich organization at the Credit Suisse Bank. 51, 50%. You have in Russia 80%. When you give to somebody to the hand of the power such a concentrated economic power. Well, after that, your hope should be that he's going to be a good man. But if he is not, you are going to get a problem. Or in some countries, by example, in my country, in Ukraine, 82. In Armenia, 88. Does it make sense to speak of, uh, about the legacy of such a system? Our only hope is that this 1% they are very kind people, very intellectual. Uh, they will manage our nation, our nation independently and fairly, which is not the case. Uh, and what is interesting, last movements in the United States, economic changes, are not to the positive side. They will deepen such a tendency. Just last tax reform, cutting uh, profit tax from 35% to 21. Warren Buffett already said, you know, but we make on that reform, we make $23 billion additional profit. We don't need it. You know? We are going to see what happened at the end of 19th century with Carnegie, with Rockefeller, with J.P. Uh, Morgan, etc., etc. Uh, Vanderbilt, people who created America at the end of 19th century. So now look to the, to the, the, to the most, most powerful nations by GDP per capita, you know, without PP, PPP. So the Liechtenstein, 120, $130,000 per capita. Then we have Luxembourg, Swiss, Norway, Ireland. Well, these are these are most 10 richest countries in the world. And now, you have most poor countries, you know. Burundi, well, it is $278. Uh, then you have Malawi, Central African Republic, Mozambique. At the end, you have Sierra Leone, something like $500 per capita. And uh, when you are having a look to the income distribution, 
you have 8.8% of the global population with 0.0% of income. So in fact, almost 900 million people, they have a problem to have food. Almost. Almost 15% of the global world's population, they have problems. These people, the, the, this, the, this is the extreme poverty. Extreme poverty. It's it get, it growing up. It's not getting down. Uh, you have a lot of average countries. Here you have a progress. So, by example, like China or like India, because thanks to them, the graph is changed a little bit. By the way, a couple of words on China. We have 11,000 years of the economic civilization, economic history, 11,000 years. Out of these 11,000 years, 10,800 years, China always was number one by GDP per capita. This had been removed last 200 centuries after the Industrial Revolution. Just for you to be informed that what China is doing now, they are just catching up what they have had during the human history, during the economic civilization. Of course, but it doesn't change a lot because China is growing up, India is growing up, former poor countries, former the emerging countries, but on the other hand, you are squeezed out something like 15% of <coughs> world's population. That's happening. In any way, the gap between most rich and most poor countries is growing up. Among the average, you find some essential players where there is a progress. But we are going to see what type of progress is in India, for example. We are going to see that also. Uh, uh, and it is clear, 100 years ago, in 1918, the gap between most poor and most wealthy nations, most rich nations, nations was 15 to 20 times. Nowadays it is 540 times. 540 times. But all of them, they are, they, they are sons of the God, you know. They would like to have some life. When you teach somebody, unindependently, he is from the United States or from the Armenia or from Africa, they are equal. They are getting up, they are catching up, you know. And when you educate people, by the education, the difference is very low. When are getting educated, they're starting to understand why I should, shall have this bad life. Let's do something. Well, and what is the problem here? The problem is even, it isn't even that, that there is a big difference. The problem is there is no chance for the poor countries. If you are having the luck, how they are going to be developed? How they are going to accelerate economic growth? Racho, tell us, no chance. If the issue is connected with the investments, you have more investment to the west than to the east. The streams of investments, by the way, for the United States, they have got last day, 2060, they have got net if the FDI, foreign direct investment, 430 billions. So they get 430 billions more than they made out of America, you know. And this tendency, last 10 years, is clear. So these are, in terms of investment, poor countries are financing rich ones. This is the global stream. Whatever you told that tra corporations, transnational corporations, creating jobs, etc. So no, no, it's not, it's not the case. In total. In total streams, it's not the case. And that is why in these poor countries, you have a consumption more than 90%. There are no means to be invested into the economy. They are not going to be rich, that's for sure, in 10 or 20 years from now. Never. Because uh, final consumption here, the last figures, is more than 90%. That means they have, there are no, no way, they, you have no ways to find some means to invest. Uh, well, uh, and have a look to that, the inequality within nations. For example, well, 
I took my country. Uh, it's not. It doesn't mean that Armenia is worst example. But you know, I, I, I did like this in my country. Ten more. Well, of course, it's connected that my country is small one. You know, it's not the United States. It's not a China. You know, uh, 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 in my country, by example, one percent of rich people they own twenty nine percent of the GDP. You know, it, it's too big. Well, how you can do a democracy in such a country? I'm not a socialist. I'm dissident. During the Soviet time, when I was very young, you know, I, I, I have been put it into the into the different places in KGB. Why my thinking way is oriented to the market economy? But nowadays, I'm starting to become a socialist or communist or something like this. What's happening in this case? So, to be frank with you, for example, in my country, we were not, we were able to change the system. We were able to create market economy, and then, but we were not able to succeed. Final su success was, final success was missing. For example, in the other country, Ukraine, which is bigger, with the 42 million population, with the GDP, and the country is the biggest country in Europe by territory, yeah? But yeah, again, you have, one percent, that's, that's official data, one percent, uh, ten big richest families, the, the wealth of them is equal to the 14 percent of GDP. And what type of revolution you are going to do in such a countries like Armenia, like Ukraine, in a, one or two days, you see that these all rich people are coming back to the power, taking decisions, doing everything. In Russia, then again, you see, Russia is a very big country. The biggest country by territory and the by population 140 billion, you know, 9.7%. India, the fastest growing economy in the world nowadays. But I, well, I, don't, I, I do not have big hope connected with India. Because the concentration of the, of the, of the wealth is very sharp, you know. 5.3 percent. Well, let's let's compare with the Germany. We, we have here 150 years history of the capitalism. It's just 3.4 percent. Turkey, they are showing good performance, 2.6. U.S. 2.4. Japan and China, something like one 1.3 percent. And here I can tell you that there is a bit of potential in China if they are going efficiently to control. So, what is the conclusion? of my speech. Follow for that in the countries. Don't, well, I, I, I'm not a communist to say that socialist, you know, you have to equalize. In this case, you will lose the motivation to work. But it should be controlled, you know. It should be, it should be, but because in such a type of world, don't see any continued processes on globalization. You will see very sharp, very contradicting political events between countries and within countries. That's the idea, and that's the result of my research. And here, here was a short presentation of that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. So. I think we can we can go for the questions if somebody has something. The Prime Minister talk here about the yes, I'm coming the, about the evolution in legality the, during the revolution uh, industrial revolution before and after uh, the GDP between the countries and the low income countries and the high income countries how the concentration of the of the riches uh, the percentage of the richest people in those countries. So I think he, he raised very, very, very tough questions about uh, how we can control and how those richest people in our young democracy can help in the, in the process of taking the decisions. So uh, yeah, I, I think you have a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. So, so please, uh, go yes. ahead. Hello, sir. Thank you for the fantastic presentation, and thank you for coming um, this morning. I wanted to ask, uh, my name is Man from the USA. I wanted to ask, in Oman, where are the top 10 richest families of what? Armenia. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. In Armenia, where are the top 10 richest um, families getting their wealth? Sorry, what? In Armenia, what? Armenia. Yeah, Armenia. Armenia. Yeah, how are they getting their wealth? 
Sorry? How are they acquiring their wealth, especially so quickly after a revolution? Well, we have, well, but that's happening during the evolution of the economic system after transition into the market economy. Okay. So yeah. is it through like exports and imports? Is it through yes, we have export, imports, etc., etc. Why we, we have got this situation in Armenia, yeah? You, it, this is your question. Because we were wrong, first of all, we were wrong on the tax policy. Promoting, promoting very successful businesses, etc., etc., you know. We were not able to, 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 be, uh, to manage as a state neutrally the business. The first one, there was an amalgamation uh, uh, business with the power, political power. And the, as a result, we have got the situation. We have got the situation like this. Uh, by the way, you have the same situation in the United States. Say thank you to two results, Theodore and Franklin Delano. They destroyed this concentration. Don't be surprised at the end. In 1902, five families were controlling 34% of US economy, 100 years ago. Uh, please say thank you to the two Roosevelt's. And especially the second one, during the war, he decentralized the economy. And nowadays, in the United States, they explain the success of the Second World War thanks to the decentralization of the economy in the United States. And the Russians are saying that they win because there was a centralization of the economy in the former Soviet Union. And now that's contradicting. But you know, such things happening, such things happen. But the situation in your country was much more terrible. It was very hard. I'm not come, I, I didn't came here to say, look to me. I was a very nice guy. Uh, to be frank with you, after my, oh, I, I was the prime minister who trans transferred the economy. Armenia was most successful case even with vis-a-vis -vis with Georgia or Baltic countries at the very beginning of transformation. Uh, but you should be informed that people used to hate me after that. Because you transfer this social system of communism to the market economy. Now people, I think, I hope, people love me. Maybe because I don't care politics anymore. Maybe for that. But what happened? I have nowadays our President Sarkisian as an opponent of such idea, saying that, look, don't be serious to the Bagration's charts, you know, what he did when he was prime minister. It's not the case. When I was prime minister in Armenia, that was not good life. I had a problem understanding what is going on, how to stop it. Nobody could say that Bagration cheated even one dollar. Nobody in Armenia. Everybody will say, we hate this guy, but he was honest. Okay? But what happened at that time? We have 40, the, the best country in the world, by this figure is Denmark. We had 40%, 40% of GDP as a, as a salary paid to the, to the employees, et cetera, et cetera. After me, Democrats came to power saying that these liberal guys, well, remove them, these guys, it's liberalism brings to the concentration of power. And what we have got after that, we, are, we have got 32%. A sort of socialist came to the power. By the way, by the way, when Holland was a, as a socialist, was a president of the, in France, the concentration Polarization of wealth was sharpening in France vis-a-vis -vis with Chirac's or Sarkozy time. So the, one, a country which is controlling that, to my mind very well, is Denmark. I always appreciate what they do. And you have to be very careful with the tax system in these cases. You have to be very careful with the banking system. So the, so the, so the, so the enemy of, of polarization, a uh, friend of polarization is the banking system. Usually in each type of country, you have deposits paid by people, common people, and the loans, assets in my part of the world, paid to the big businesses, to the big companies. 
So the banking system like this is circulating and redistributing money to the, to the, to the wealth ones, to the rich people. Well, we were trying to do something. We were not successful. Unfortunately, after us, the things are not getting better. Uh, yeah. Uh. yeah, that's what. Uh, thank you, Joseph, California, United States. Prime Minister, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, what were you speaking about in your, um, in your clarity of the income inequality is uh, it's, a, it's a growing movement globally right now. Uh -huh. uh, and speaking as well from the United States, we're see we saw it uh, from the Bernie Sanders movement. Uh, and that was defined as democratic socialism uh, and seen as a way to combat the stigma of communism or also the word socialism, as uh, globally uh, those words are sometimes connected with authoritarian powers. Uh, my question would be, uh, in that regard, how would you define the movement of fighting income inequality? Um, and what proper term would you give it? And then also, how are you involved in it? Uh, as well, outside of um, presenting today? Well, the principal thing is, oh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not a liberal or socialist, but frankly, I do believe in the economy when you have uh, the grade of the competition is higher. That is why, for me, first thing against inequality increase is a competition to increase the level of the competi competition within the countries. Do not prat creating these big companies. It, nowadays, that's very important because they are able, the big companies are concentrating technology on their end. You know, in a three years, in a three years, we have accumulating an information which is equal what we did before that during 10 years, 10,000 years. And the concentration of this information creates a technology. And it is concentrated on the hand of the big companies. And the end won't be, they, they won't be a happy end there. The second thing is, it is, is taxation. It's a system of the redistribution. Taxation, at least, I'm not going to say, don't tax poor people. But nowadays, what we are doing in Armenia and what we are doing in the United States, you are taxing Rich people less than poor ones. So it, 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 could, it could not work. Imagine what is going to happen with the United States within 10 years after the Trump's tax reform. You are going to, instead of, instead of in the United States, instead of 2.4% to see 7, 8%. What will be the result then? When you have an economy concentrated on the power of a couple of people, you are concentrating, concentrating financial resources, you are concentrating politics. And the concentration of the politics could bring to violent use of such a force. And we observe that. And it's a pity, it's a pity that you decided to join, how to say, I don't want to see the United States Sovietized, you know, like this. But the Soviet economy also was uh, concentrated on the power of the Communist Party, you know. I would like, I would, I would be happy to see a market economy place it there. I would like to see competition, free competition. Well, look, look, in the United States, you have a, each year you have 48,000 new products. 40,000 out of them are used by big companies. We're going to see more, more, more power on the Apple, I don't know, Microsoft, etc. So what? What is the result of that? What will be the result of that? I think that there is a problem. In this part of the world, post-Soviet countries, well, you know, I'm also a professor working at Kiev University in Ukraine. Huh? Well, I'm going after this, this uh, conference, I will go to, to Ukraine. But you have to change it. But that, uh, people are able to make a revolution, saying that we would like to change. After revolution, normally you have a government, but this government step by step is starting again to, to, to protect the interests of uh, rich people. 
big companies. And then again, after these revolutions, you are starting to think, or we, we were stupid romantics. That there was a romantism there, and the result is zero. Uh, and that, that, that's, that, and uh, to my mind, indeed, you have, you have to change the situation. The reproduction of the economy from the reproduction should benefit poor people and also rich people also give a chance to the other part of the society in order to get more chances for innovation, so creativeness. Don't concentrate the creativeness on the hand of a, just a, of a group of people. This is what I do believe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.